I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the uh, Distinguished Lecture Series in the College of Engineering. And I'm, uh, my name is Enrique Laverne, and I have the privilege of, of serving as, as our dean. And I am absolutely delighted and honored to have a special guest here today, um, Dr. Iris Rosakis, who is the <coughs> Theodore von Karman Professor of Aeronautics and Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Chair of Caltech's Division of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, Dr. Rosakis's talk today is entitled Identifying the unique ground motion signatures of super shear earthquakes, the one-two punch effect on high-rise buildings. We will all feel very safe on high-rise <laughs> buildings. Let me tell you a few words, and there'll be more than a few, because uh, Aris is a rather um, special um, scientist. He is an expert in solid mechanics, dynamic mechanical properties, ballistic impact, and the hypervelocity impact of micrometeorites on spacecraft. The later topic has become of increasing concern for spacecraft missions. In the 80s, he introduced the concept of laboratory earthquakes, and since then, his research interests have focused primarily on the mechani mechanics of seismology, the physics of dynamic shear rupture and frictional sliding in a laboratory seismology. The goal of this body of work is to create in a controlled and repeatable environment surrogate laboratory earthquake scenarios that mimic various processes that occur in real earthquakes. Dr. Rosakis received his BA and MA degrees in engineering science from Oxford University in 78, followed by his uh, science master's and PhD in solid mechanics from Brown University in 1980 and 82. I'd like to add that I had the privilege as an undergraduate of working in the same lab with then PhD candidate Aris Rosakis when he was at Brown. <laughs> so I have many stories about Aris that I can tell you, but he has the same stories about me, so we tend to be very quiet. <laughs> he joined Caltech uh, shortly after that as an assistant professor of aeronautics and applied mechanics in 82, became associate professor in 88, and full professor in 93. He became the interim co-director of Caltech's graduate aeronautical laboratories in 03, and then served as director from 04 to 09. Um, in summer of 05, Dr. Rosakis visited the Department of Terre, Atmosphere, Ocean at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. He's been a visiting professor at Oxford in 08 and a visiting scientist at Columbia in the summer of the same year. And he became the chair of Caltech's Division of Engineering and Applied Science in the spring of 09. He's a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Geophysical Union, the New York Academy of Science, and the Seismological Society of America. He was named a fellow of the American Society of ME in 95, and in 2009, he was named a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and Oxford Society of Experimental Mechanics. So you can imagine he has many honors, including uh, awards such as the Society of Experimental Mechanics, in 2010, he received ASME's Robert Henry Thurston's Lecture Award, Brown University's Engineering Alumni Award, and the Society of Engineering Sciences AC Erringen Medal. <coughs> and more recently, I learned he has been elected to receive the Commandeur de l'Ordre des Palmes Académiques from the French Republic. In 2010, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, which is perhaps the highest recognition that an engineering faculty can receive. He has nine patents, including uh, one that started in 2000, entitled Coherent Gradient Sensing Method and System for Measuring Surface Curvatures. He has co-authored more than 180 journal papers and about 300 publications in conference proceedings. Many of these concern the quasi-static and dynamic failure of metals, composites, and interfaces, with emphasis on the use of high-speed visible and IR diagnostics and laser interferometry. Since 1981, he has given more than 170 invited lectures, and now for lecture 171, <laughs> Paris, I am absolutely delighted on behalf of the college. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enrique, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I have never visited your campus uh, before, and I have been delighted. I have spent a, f a wonderful day here, and uh, uh, meeting with various people, uh, people in various departments and seeing the success that uh, uh, engineering at Davis has been uh, for many years, but particularly under your leadership. Um, I promise that I will not show my photographs of the time that we were together at Brown if you don't show yours. Uh, <laughs> 
So, well, um, today I would like to actually tell you the curious and remarkable story of super shear earthquakes. In particular, I would like to uh, uh, discuss the identification of the unique ground motions, uh, the signatures resulting from, from such events, the super shear earthquakes, and discuss uh, the one-two punch effect that they may have on high-rise buildings. Uh, this slide really is uh, uh, an outline of my talk. Uh, so I will not have a, a formal outline. What I will do is say a few words about historical earthquakes that may have been super shear earthquakes. And I will concentrate on one particular one, which is the 2002 magnitude 7.9 Denali, Alaska earthquake. And there is a reason for that, and you'll see why. But as a preview, let me tell you that the records associated with that particular earthquake rupture are excellent, and uh, they are from locations very close to the fault. I'll go back to that. After that, I'm going to take you immediately to the laboratory and show you how in a very controlled, safe, and very well-instrumented environment, uh, we can actually create surrogate mini-earthquakes that mimic uh, real earthquake events. And then, you see, the next step is to see how to scale this result up to the real Si the size of the real earth and the real earthquake rupture. Now, the biggest drama of seismology as a science is the fact that they cannot control their laboratory. They cannot control where the new earthquake is going to happen. So they can go and instrument it properly. And we have uh, situations like um, uh, a high concentration of instruments in Parkfield, for example. Uh, in a segment of the San Andreas Fault, and we have scientists that have been waiting for 20 years for a respectable earthquake in Parkfield. So here we, we use engineering principles, and we use the fact that in the laboratory we can control the situation, we can instrument the situation. Of course, we are using surrogate earthquakes, that means we have to pay a price here. And unless the principles of mechanics are enough to allow us to scale up to the real thing, we haven't done much. So after scaling up, I'm going to shake a few buildings for your amusement. So let me start with a very small uh, tutorial because the audience is from engineering. Uh, so I would like to establish uh, the terminology. So earthquake is a term that uh, all of us know uh, describes both sudden slip on a fault and the resulting ground shaking and radiated seismic energy caused by slip. And here is a famous photograph of the San Andreas Fault of, uh, in this location here, which to me as a mechanician is a vertically dipping weak plane between two plates that are subjected to compression and shear. And this is the static loading, or actually quasi-static. The rate of loading is about 20 millimeters per year in this location. It's about 60 millimeters per year in Japan. <clears throat> so, earthquakes themselves are spontaneous frictional shear ruptures occurring along these weak planes in the Earth's crust. I am concentrating only on strike-slip faults, which are the vertical type. I am not discussing thrust faults, for example, in this, uh, in this talk. So what do I mean by spontaneous? Spontaneous implies quasi-static tectonic loading and sudden triggering of dynamic slip. So it is loaded. It's like a cocked gun and ready to, to be fired. So when it is fired, a rupture tip is generated, and a rupture uh, is uh, propagates uh, along the frictional or incoherent interface. Now, in engineering, we are used to coherent or glued interfaces. Interfaces, say, between two materials in composites. Um, 
uh, that have intrinsic toughness and strength. This is a different type of interface. It's an incoherent interface, and it derives its strength from the fact that it's frictional and we have compressive stresses as well as shear. Um, so, but really, again, if uh, from the point of view of a fraction, a fracture mechanician like myself, the the rupture is a very big crack that will start propagating at one location, the hypocenter, and propagate for kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, uh, depending on how big the earthquake will be. And it propagates usually bilaterally from the hypocenter to the right and left. Or it could be, in certain cases, unilateral, starting from one place and going uh, along the interface. But it never leaves the interface. And that's a very big difference to usual cracks. If I throw a stone on your window, I will create cracks. Those are opening cracks. They are not shear cracks. And they don't go along specific planes. They choose uh, specific directions according to certain principles. This one is confined to be in the interface. And that makes a huge difference. <clears throat> so when such a thing happens, I go to the field and I see uh, the, uh, the results of seismometers. Those, this is ground acceleration as a function of time in seconds. And sometimes I see pictures like this, and sometimes I see pictures like this. And what is the difference to the untrained eye? Let me show you some things. This is the ground shaking. There is first the arrival of the pressure waves. Remember, when the earthquake happens, there are waves, that the, the fastest waves, that are pressure waves, that the sound waves, that go with certain uh, speed in crustal rock. In air, there's only pressure waves. There is no shear waves. In the Earth, we have also shear waves that go like this. And they propagate with a slower speed, so they come later. So the event happens, the pressure waves arrive, the shear wave arrives, and then the rupture is close to the station, and the ground shaking starts. And this is associated with outer plane, Rayleigh waves, like the ocean waves. Those are the three things to remember. But there are some anomalous records like this, in which the pressure wave comes, and there is no shear wave. And the ground shaking happens before the shear wave happens. So something else has come faster than the shear wave. And it is these earthquakes that I would like to speak to you about. These are the ones that I call super shear. And it has to do with the speed of dynamic unzipping. You should think of an earthquake rupture like your sweater and a zipper. It is the zipping speed which actually determines what kind of uh, ground shaking you will experience, among other things. So in the, the left case, the zipping speed is lower than the shear wave speed. In the right case, it could be higher. So let me take you to um, <clears throat> a slide that shows you what happens according to the conventional wisdom in seismology. Within the resolution of the inversion process, my seismology colleagues at Caltech will tell me that the zipper speed, the, the, the motion of the rupture, would be between 80% and 100% of the Rayleigh wave speed of the crustal rock. These are surface waves, as I said before, the Rayleigh waves. And that's roughly the speed of the unzipping. However, there have been evidence recently of some anomalous events in which the rupture speed is lower than the pressure waves, but higher than the shear waves. Those are called super shear earthquakes. And here we have some examples. They are not in order of discovery, but they are in order of occurrence. There is now evidence that in 1906, uh, San Francisco earthquake was a super shear event. Um, parts of uh, the Imperial Valley, definitely the Izmit earthquake in Turkey that was really devastating. 30,000 people lost their lives. Uh, 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 in, in Tibet, 
Kun Lun San, and most important for this talk, Denali, Alaska. I call these my perf personal favorites because they exhibit a mechanics phenomenon that I'm interested in which is actually not only they were super shear in rapture, they exhibit a transition from sub Rayleigh to super shear that we can document. And in particular, the last one that I would like to, uh, to concentrate on um, had some fantastic records thanks to pipeline companies. Energy companies spend a lot of money for the seismometers. They're not poor as university scientists. So actually, here is the fault here. This is the weak plane, the line of rapture. The rapture started from here, it started unzipping, going this way. At a certain point, just before this black line here, which is the Trans-Alaska pipeline, it became super shear. Changed the speed from just below the Rayleigh wave speed to the shear wave, to actually above the shear wave speed of the, of the crustal rock, producing a shear Mach cone. The signal was picked up at pump station 10, three kilometers north of, of the fault, and it was an excellent signal. And it was perhaps the only signal that was picked up with such accuracy at such a close location. Now, as I said, I'm a fraction mechanician, so why am I interested in this signal? I'm interested in this because it's a very clear near fault signal, or it's near the crack tip. So it is actually, it bears the signature of the dynamic rapture. If I had a station here or 100 kilometers away, it's good for the inversion process, but it's kind of useless. It's just vibrations for the mechanics point of view. Here is the signal. Here is what happened to the, pipe, to the pipeline that was on rollers, by the way, five meters displacement. And that was, um, <clears throat> there was, this is the little shack here that recorded the, uh, uh, the signal. And what you see here is velocity in meters per second. This is fault normal, meaning the velocity at this station normal to the fault, and the other one is fault parallel. Two components. This is still seismology. In classical seismology, you would expect the fault parallel component, the am maximum amplitude, to be smaller than the fault normal component. This is the opposite. And also, there are some very weird signatures. Usually you expect a blip like this or a, and a blip like this and no, none of that. There is a signature, a trailing signature that was very curious. So seismologists started worrying about this. They could not invert. They could not understand. They could not make their models fit this scenario without something unusual uh, being invoked. So let me now take you to the laboratory. So what I, my goal is to take you to the laboratory and show you that this scenario that we are proposing here, the issue of a super shear rupture that will have all these characteristics, can be generated in the laboratory as the first step. So here is the complicated um, rupture geometry. The simplest geometry in the laboratory is two pieces of uh, plastic it's homolite 100, it's photoelastic, put together in frictional contact under compression. There is a resolved shear stress, there is a resolved normal stress here. It is static loading, and this hopefully will host the earthquake. So this is a very simple surrogate of the rock, which is the photoelastic polymer, the fault, which is the inclined contact interface, which can be inclined at different uh, angles, the tectonic stress, which is the, uh, uh, the far field load, and then I need a triggering site. I need to start the, the rupture. So this is sitting there, not, not rupturing yet. So let me go to the next one to show you a little bit of the setup. Um, so what we do is we have these two pieces under compression. And this is the inclined interface. And what we do is we drill a very small hole the size of, your, of human hair 
and we put a copper or nickel wire and we, uh, uh, we actually um, uh, attach to them two clips that are attached to uh, a capacitor and we discharge uh, a massive charge creating a very small plasma explosion. So basically in the interface what you will see the hole is here and there is a very small plasma expo explosion that actually reduces the pressure locally and it creates an instability. So basically by reducing the, the pressure, you, re you reduce the frac frictional resistance and the rupture starts propagating to the right and left with very high speeds. And I will show it to you uh, in a second. But before I do so, let me tell you that this is something that was started uh, in collaboration with Professor uh, uh, James Rice at Harvard and with my colleague at Caltech who was the uh, previous director of the Seismolab, uh, Professor Kanamori, and of course our, our graduate student Kaiwan Sia who is now a, a professor at the University uh, of Toronto. Uh, so this is how the setup looks. And in addition to, actually I don't want to spend time on, on this slide, uh, I think this is a better one. Uh, here is the inclined interface. And in addition um, <coughs> to the other diagnostics that I have, I have here, you will see this is the, the specimen. Uh, there are two high-speed cameras looking at it. There is a laser illuminating it. And it is the photoelastic technique, which I will, it's a classical technique in experimental mechanics, which is sensitive to maximum shear stresses and basically it's perfect for a shear dominated uh, 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 phenomenon like, like this. In addition, there are, there are three velocimeters, laser velocimeters, that are capable of, of measuring the particle velocities at discrete locations with very high microsecond re resolution. So we have equivalent, things equivalent to seismometers. Uh, by actually, uh, uh, looking at four parallel um, velocities above and below the fault, we can actually get an idea of the slip as it uh, progresses, but we can also get an idea of the ground shaking in this laboratory surrogate experiment. Enough with, uh, with descriptions. I would like to show you some images now. So here is your San Andreas fault or your incoherent interface, a section say, of the San Andreas Fault. San Francisco is here, Los Angeles is there, very roughly. You can actually make it uh, mimic the exact geometry of the fault, and if you take care of your scaling properly. And here is the hole where the plasma exp explosion will happen. And when this is going to slide, it's going to slide this way. This is called right lateral slip in seismology. So I press the trigger, and here it is. This is a sequence of photographs that shows you the evolution of slip in this kind of an arrangement. Let me go back one second. And I would like to say that as the explosion happens, there is a pressure wave that is emitted, the fast one. There is an S wave, shear wave that's emitted. And this part of the interface is starting to slip. This is still coherent. The zippers, the two zippers are here. So as I continue, you will see that this, this is not as simple for a long time. So this is actually the slipped part. There are some, some concentrations of stresses here, and something is starting to, hap to happen in the front. And as I continue, you will see that this something becomes triangular in shape. And because rupture, or the rupture tip, exceeds the shear wave, the shear is this, the shear wave is this uh, circle. It goes faster than the shear wave, creating a Mach cone, like in a supersonic aeroplane. But in a supersonic aeroplane, the Mach cone is associated actually with the pressure waves. This is associated with the shear waves. Though this is a jump in shear stresses, not a jump in direct stresses. Um, <coughs> And there is a distance associated with this transition from one to another. This distance, if I call L, one can actually write down a lot of mathematics. 
and predict that the distance of transition is, is associated to the load to the power minus 3 over 2. And of course, the angle and other things, the frictional parameters. But it's interesting that the more tectonic stress I apply, the earlier the transition happens. So there are some earthquakes that if the local conditions and orientations are such, they will be born very fast, and others, they will never make it. The truth of the matter is that most earthquakes prefer to go below this speed, or when they attempt going above this speed, the distance that they already travel is of the order of 100 kilo, 50 to 100 kilometers, and most of them lose steam by that time because they, they meet a jog, they meet uh, any irregularity, complexity in, in the field, and they either stop or decelerate. But there are some that don't. It's about these ones that I would like to, to discuss today. So if I actually look at this, and of course, you know, I can measure things from these images. I can measure stresses. I can measure the rupture speeds. And it's actually interesting to see what happens to the rupture speeds. And the next uh, uh, one is actually uh, the rupture speed in meters per second in the experiment versus location of the rupture from the hypocenter as it extends. So initially, and that is actually plotted for, for the same load but two different angles, a steeper angle and a, and a slightly smaller angle. And as you can see that uh, if I concentrate first um, uh, in these, uh, these symbols here, uh, these correspond to the more benign angle. Uh, initially, the speed is very close, as most earthquakes in the experiment is also very close to about 80%, 80 to 100% of the Rayleigh wave speed, which is here. And then there is a jump, and they hover around this line here. And this line actually is a magic number that comes out from elasticity. It's the square root of 2 of Cs of the shear wave speed. It's actually shocking that the square root of 2 has a significance. And then the top line here is the dilatational wave speed or the pressure wave speed. And no, nothing exceeds that. So if I increase the angle, you see the red symbols that jump again from the same place to a higher point in this band. And this band is what we call the stable super shear speed regime. And you can actually look at the literature, and this is actually my one of my PhD advisors from Brown, who had, uh, in theory, without having observed this phenomenon ever, looked at these special significances of these speeds. And here it is this speed regime between the square root of 2 of the shear wave speed and the pressure wave speed that stable super shear rupture can propagate only along weak planes. One of the reasons that engineers have never observed this <coughs> is that engineers look for mode 1 opening cracks, normal cracks, that don't go along specific interfaces. Once you allow a crack to be trapped by an interface and become also shear, it can have the possibility of living here, outside the sub Rayleigh regime. So, <clears throat> okay, let me for your amusement, since I am a professor of uh, aeronautics, I would like to remind you how a Mach front sounds as an airplane goes by. It is these shock waves that are associated with a P wave speed that actually, when they reach the ground, they create the jump in pressure and the audio effect that you see. What I am interested in, in analogy to this, is when I have an earthquake or a shear rupture now propagating the solid with these very high speeds with a Mach cone, how would my building shake? Because, you know, even if your ear is so uh, uh, disturbed by the, the pressure shock, the question is how would ground shaking be affected by the ground shock? Uh, uh, by the, the, pre the presence of a, a super shear rupture. So again, um, 
I don't have to say too much. There is a specimen, but here there are three velocimeters that would look at a particular point as these ruptures go by. And they can do so for different types of earthquakes. We can do that for Sabrelli earthquakes, slower ones, faster ones, and so on under different, under this, uh, different conditions. <coughs> so what, again, by using a series of images, let me contrast two cases that look nominally the same. They are not. One is going to be a sub classical earthquake. The other one is going to be a super shear earthquake. The difference is that the applied loading is slightly different. One transitions, the other doesn't make it. So in my mind is that in the super shear case, it is like having the little seismometers of the Denali waiting here so I can actually see the similarities or the differences. So I will click, and on the bottom you're going to see the fault, the fault normal, the red, and the fault parallel component of particle velocity at this point as the earthquake goes by. Equivalently, this is the velocity record of a seismometer, which usually gives acceleration. If you integrated that, you'll get the velocity, or if I differentiate this velocity, I will get particle acceleration. Um, and let me show you how they look. So here I create my two earthquakes. They look the same at this point, but one of them to the right is going to transition. And perhaps you see the triangle happening. And not much has happened in this one. The pressure wave is here. You see the, uh, the outside circle, the shear wave is here. But in this one, at the same time exactly, this one goes faster. The Mach cone is approaching towards my point of observation. And it's affecting the seismometer, so to speak. And as I plot, you start seeing the differences. Now, not much has happened here yet, but a lot of things have happened in the super shear case. Um, and then we continue clicking. And as a matter of fact, something else is about to happen in the super shear case as this particular strain signature that follows this Mach cone is coming through the point of observation. And let me click with this and finish. And now I have two records. And of course, they look confusing the first time that you see it. But I will, let me uh, try and say a few things about them. They correspond to something that looks very similar, the only difference being a slight difference in pressure. First observation, let me start with the Sabrelli one. The fault normal component shaking in this direction is bigger than shaking in this direction. This is classical. So Professor Kanamori will say, open a textbook, and you will see it. If you put a dynamic dislocation there and you move it, that's what you're going to see roughly. In this case, though, the irregular, the super shear earthquake, it's the opposite. The blue is bigger than the red. So the fault parallel shaking of the building, or whatever you are, uh, is much less than the fault normal part. But the fault normal has two signatures. It has the first part when the shock wave goes by, and it has a second part when this little blip, let me go back, and I want you now to concentrate here. There is the triangle, but there is something here. And as I'm going to go by, you will see when this blip goes by here, there will be another signature. So at this point, the blip is at the point of the arrows, and it gives a second signature that actually has a big, almost as big, for normal component. So you never win. What I'm trying to say is that what we are having here is a rupture that tip that goes super sheer. By itself, we have the first set of, of very sharp hits, very high rise time, as you can see. But then the remnants of the old rupture that has been left behind as a Rayleigh wave is also going to shake your building a second time and in the other direction. And that's a very important. 
when I was uh, uh, discussing with uh, uh, colleagues from civil engineering the nature of shaking of the buildings and the history dependence of damage. So this is something to remember here. So, okay. This is the actual record obtained from Denali and the general features are actually quite well captured by the experimental. The number of peaks, the issue, the fact that the red is smaller than the blue is captured in this particular case. Now, let me tell you that this was not exactly the scaled location. I will show you what happened when we did proper scaling and we tried to compare exactly the Denali record. But this was a location that was a little bit closer to the fault than Denali was in a scaled geometrical sense. <clears throat> but still, it's something that has the same nature, meaning that there is initial shockwave effect followed by an effect of the trailing railing. Imagine a mother crack giving birth to a daughter crack that goes faster than the mother, and the dying mother is still actually following behind. Maybe a bad analogy, but... Uh, <coughs> uh, so, of course, let's go back to mechanics. Can we see some of this in classical solutions of dynamic fracture mechanics? So again, going back to the work of my advisor, Ben Friend, and some of the work from Brown, Clifton and Friend, who were not losing, uh, looking at seismological problems, by the way. They were doing general solutions of dynamic uh, fracture because the issues do not exist. But still, the solutions exist. You can go and solve for things that are relevant to this point. This is the asymptotic solution, which is a steady state asymptotic solution, idealized, of dynamic crack moving at a speed which is less than the shear wave speed, and then the same one moving at a speed that is higher than the shear wave speed. And you see the Mach cones, actually. Very similar to the Mach cones that you see in the experiment. You see the jumps. But of course, being steady state, you don't see this transition. You don't see this little flower of the, of the dying mother following behind it, because this needs a transient solution, not a steady state solution. But if you look at the mathematics here, you will see that in the regime of rupture speed, of unzipping speed, less than the Rayleigh wave speed, the fault normal is bigger than the fault parallel, as uh, seen in the experiment and as seen in the real earthquakes. When you are in this stable regime between the square root of 2, this magical number, and the pressure wave speed, the opposite happens. The fold parallel is bigger than the fold normal. But of course, this is limited information only for the shock waves in the front, not what follows afterwards. But this is a very encouraging one says that the dynamic elasticity really, as it should, does the job. <clears throat> and basically, uh, confirms what we see experimentally. Of course, in order to see the full shebang of, uh, uh, of transient solutions, I would like to show you a numerical calculation that actually shows the, the slip here and the transition. There is the Mach cone, there is what uh, the trailing Rayleigh flowers that was telling you, and that's what we see experimentally. And this is purely numerical, this is finite elements. And of course, you have to put the right physics there and so on, but qualitatively you see a very similar picture of the transition. And it is, your building will be affected by both this that will hit it, but also by this that will move it. In the classical case, you will only have one of these contributions. So actually you can go and and look at velocity fields from the finite element calculation. I don't want to go into great details here. The top is the sub -Rayleigh, half of the sub -Rayleigh calculation. The bottom is the super shear one. So in the sub -Rayleigh case, you see primarily fold vertical velocity components. In the super shear calculation, you see the Mach cone. This is the trailing Rayleigh. 
in the math cone, things now are like this. Whereas on what follows, things are like this. So this is from finite elements. Just to make again sure the point that in the detail, this is the velocity field obtained for the transient case, the fully transient case, not uh, the steady state of the friend solution. <clears throat> so let me drive this home a little bit. So I hope that I have persuaded you that the experiments and the theory says that I have what I call a one-two punch. I'm a building. I have a fault here. The rupture is coming, and I'm in a near fault location, say three kilometers away. Do we have structures like this? The Golden Gate Bridge is about 100 meters from the San Andreas at a point that hosted the 1906 Super Sierra earthquake. The Bay Bridge is two kilometers roughly from the same fault. We do. The Stanford campus. If you're a bit antagonistic about Stanford campus. <laughs> it goes, the fault goes exactly through the Stanford campus. Now, the Caltech campus is, you know, a little bit more. But still. So the issue here is these buildings are going to, if such an occurrence happens, and it's going to be rare. It's going to be a big earthquake. It's going to be above 7.4. But it's due to happen at one point in the San Andreas Fault. They will experience things that we are not incorporating in our codes. How can I help them as an experimentalist with this toy Mickey Mouse experiment? It is a toy Mickey Mouse experiment. Well, perhaps the principle of mechanics can help a little bit here. The saving grace is that this is a near, uh, near fault location. In fractional mechanics lingo, it's near the moving crack tip. So I have expressions for it. I have at least models with cohesive zones, without cohesive zones, with, uh, you know, with different uh, physics. And they all have one characteristic. The particle velocities asymptotically normalized by the local shear wave speed go have this structure here. This is the, the static friction coefficient, the dynamic friction, co friction coefficient, the normal stress, the shear modulus, and other stuff of great detail that is all in a function that is between 0 and 1 in this non-dimensional form. So actually, I can go and do a little bit of dimensional analysis for near top tip locations, asymptotic locations. But even in this case, I don't need to do that. I have the real record from Denali, and I have the experimental record from a point, a few millimeters instead of a few kilometers or in the specimen. What can I do? I have here time in microseconds, and here time in seconds. I have to make sure that th this, the time in microsecond, becomes times in seconds in order for me to apply this to buildings. So I concentrate on the various signatures. So I say both of these have the trailing Rayleigh signature. There it is in blue. And this one has an equivalent part that I can identify as the trailing Rayleigh signature. And I can find its width. So I can stretch the microseconds to become seconds according to the width of identifiable signatures. That's the idea here. Of the classical sub Rayleigh part. And I will not do it for the super shear part because the classical sub Rayleigh part before the transition is very well understood and it has all the physics buried into it. I will not go into the great details. But here, as you can see, this is 4.12 uh, microseconds and this is 4.13 seconds. You see, we have a scaling factor in time of 10 to the 6. In the vertical component, I can use my dimensional analysis uh, to actually scale between crustal rock uh, wave speeds, properties, elastic properties of rocks versus polymers, and um, dynamic and static friction coefficients. But I can also force these amplitudes to be the same 
actually of the same signature. They are very lucky because they come to be very close. So the vertical scaling is set, can be set by actually looking at the details of the asymptotic analysis. Mechanics supposed to work in all length scales. And it actually works well. The stretching is done by looking at this, the sub Rayleigh signature. But there is something which remains. The relative time difference between the arrival of the shock wave and the sub Rayleigh signature. Because that is determined by the position of the station relative to the point where the rupture has transitioned from one speed to the other. So if I'm here, it will be a different distance when the mother and the daughter arrive, so to speak. <clears throat> so I don't want to bore you. I, I can basically tell you that there is a lot of mathematics that one can do by looking at this. It's actually geometry and dynamics. Uh, if I have a station and I have uh, a rupture that has transitioned its speed from one to a, uh, from a sub Rayleigh to a super shear speed, I can calculate the time of arrival of the shock wave, and I can calculate the time of arrival of the remaining uh, sub Rayleigh rupture with, with math and some uh, assumptions. And to make a long story short, I can show, and I don't, I don't want you to show you the mathematics. I basically want to show you that there is a locus of points, and this is the locus of points here, that corresponds to the same all of these points correspond to the same delay, delta t of arrival of the shock wave minus the time of arrival of the mother. So basically, at all these locations, the time difference between the arrival of the shock wave and then the arrival of the information from the uh, trailing rally is the same. All of these points will have this characteristic. And this is the locus of the points, and you can calculate it in great detail. And you can design an experiment to actually have the same delta t as the earthquake that you would like to simulate. Of course, the delta t has to be the time squeezed delta t. Because one would be in microseconds, the other one in seconds. You have to actually use the original time uh, uh, scaling on it. But it can be done. And you end up uh, with something. Remember, I had the locus of points. I want to actually identify a particular point on that locus to be my Denali point, so to speak, uh, a place where I have my seismometer. Uh, and a place that corresponds exactly to the uh, location of the real seismometer. And you have to add that a geometrical constraint, which is the rest of, of the distance of, uh, of the station to the fault over the distance of transition of the earthquake to super shear. That ratio should be the same in the experiment and in the, uh, uh, in the real earthquake. And if you combine these two constraints together, then you end up with expressions for x and y experimental that would correspond exactly to the station that, that would be the equivalent to the pump station 10 in Denali. And then uh, you can predict the shaking there, or there you can predict and scale the shaking at half the distance and double the distance. And you can do that in a systematic way and create maps. Why am I doing all this? I'm doing all this because I really want to go to the last part of my talk, which is actually try the differences. I was aching to, to I, you know, I had a, uh, uh, <coughs> basically a, uh, the experience of a supersonic airplane creating this noise in your ear, and I wanted to see what the difference would be on a shock wave, a shear shock wave, on a building, then followed by normal shaking versus only the normal shaking. And de definitely, we designed buildings with certain types of shaking that we have guidance from seismologists. And usually, this is not this kind of an earthquake. 
So what I went, uh, I did is I am not a civil engineer, but I think I understand enough to at least uh, be conversant to some of the uh, principles. I went to my young colleague, uh, that you, whose photograph is is here, um, Swaminathan Krishnan. We call him Swami, who has been developing as a number of our faculty here um, uh, various codes for buildings of different sizes. This is actually a 20-story class uh, building using a uh, frame 3D, which is one of the problems he has developed, in which he has incorporated various elements uh, that uh, calculate the damage with plasticity and some uh, fracture mechanics uh, for complete failure. Uh, history-dependent processes where the, the, the type of ground shaking will, will probably very, be very important to see what deformations and perhaps failure we would have. In this particular case, we chose a building um, which is in Woodland Hills. I know the address, but I will not tell you. And uh, this is the cross-section of this building. In this uh, uh, bu uh, uh, building, that was before it was retrofitted. Uh, this is uh, 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 according to the 82 uh, building code. Uh, there is a symmetric, as you can see here, there is a symmetric uh, placement of moment frames. The center of resistance and the center of match don't coincide. So there are twist modes that can, that can develop. And this is a particular building that he had actually um, worked on. So I, that's not my work. It's just... Uh, uh, something that we chose, and then we actually, we thought of actually using this building for the comparison. And so let me go to the comparison, and what you will see here is this building that I was telling you, uh, the same building, up and down. This one is going, uh, this one is going to be sub, uh, subjected to a normal subrail earthquake, and this one is going to be subjected to a super shear earthquake. And the ground shaking is obtained from the experiment and was scaled up by what I uh, very briefly described to you. So it is in, the shaking is in meters per second. The, uh, the time axis is in seconds. And we have placed it roughly at the place at half the distance where Denali um, the Denali station is. That would be about, um, about uh, more than one and a half, about two kilometers away from uh, the fault. <coughs> and again, before I press the button, let me tell you that the fault is running this way in both cases. So the earthquake will come this way. So fault normal is this way. Fault parallel is this way. And remember, just remember, that in the normal earthquake, the classical earthquake, fault normal would be uh, is the dominant, and fault parallel is the uh, the smaller one. So just watch this. Um, by the way, this is the top view of the terrace. You will see it uh, 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 shaking. <clears throat> so the timer is going here, and you see the ground shaking that each of these, so these are actually the velocities, these are the displacements. You're going to see some differences. I'm going to have you get a general look first. So I... I'm, uh, I'm not going to claim that this is predictive in one, in no sense. It is the comparison between the two, given one imperfect model um, that I'm interested in. And let me rerun it to show a few characteristics here. <clears throat> let me concentrate on the top, which is the super shear. You're going to see it moving in the full parallel direction first, and then suddenly it's going to also move in that direction. Whereas this one is not moving yet. So full parallel first, and then fort normal. And this one only fort normal and later. And it is this combination of, of things 
that I think makes this damage more or even collapse. It is the fact that you accumulate damage because of the first, it, you are hit by a bus by the shock wave. You accumulate damage, but you don't collapse. Then the trailing railing comes and shake you the other way. But plasticity, as Professor Defalian very well knows, uh, operates in a six-dimensional space. So basically, uh, you could load up to yield in tension, and with a little bit of, of twist, you may go. This is exactly, in one sense, the phenomenon. Of course, this is was before the retrofit, and the civil engineers would say, you know, of course, there are twisting moments. This is the 1982 code. What happens if we correct this? Uh, just for a, a glimpse of hope. This is the corrected building after it was retrofitted. The same address, 1997. Uh, the same um, trial. And let me run this. It is actually similar in shaking, but the damage is different. Indeed, the elimination of twist modes because of their symmetry has helped a lot. But again, my point is not whether it collapses or not. My point is to see the differences between the two scenarios. This is an extreme scenario, I know, but this is a scenario that we, we may be faced on, on buildings that are close to major faults like the San Andreas, where we are expecting a large magnitude earthquake. I would like to finish by basically showing you something that I'm particularly proud of, which is more not related to buildings. It's related to, this is the only thing I want to show you. Now, we wanted to actually try and match as we can the exact Denali fault by the Mickey Mouse experiment. So we did our scaling and found exactly the location of the Denali earthquake, and we introduced local curvatures of the fault and the details as much as we could and uh, did the scaling procedure. And here, the, the Denali record from the pipeline is the red one, and the blue one is the experiment scaled. And I, I'm particularly proud of this, because I think that the Mickey Mouse experiment that is on a piece of plastic, without the structure of the Earth, um, scaled with proper mechanical principles, I think this is an excellent, actually, it is al almost looks uh, fraudulent. Uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is the following. Why is this such a good comparison? I think there's only one explanation. And, uh, but I would love to hear your, uh, your ideas. I think the explanation is that we are in locations that we are very close to the fault. And we are within the region of dominance of the, uh, of the structure of the crack tip field, dynamic crack tip field. So actually, the dynamics and the mechanics dominate over everything. They swamp everything. It's not like having a station 100 kilometers away that uh, receives some ringing after reflections from different parts of the Earth and where the structure has confused everything. It is because we are dealing with, I think, it's because we are dealing with a near tip um, situation. However, it is important because our buildings are located three to five uh, kilometers close to this fault. Thank you. Your, your experimentation is just so elegant. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. <laughs> I was wondering if you tried to resolve the motions maybe in different directions. You, you think about the normal and the, the yes. parallel, but it seems like you should look, or it would be interesting anyway, to look at normal to the shock front or parallel to the shock front. Absolutely. And I, that, I was wondering if you get the maximum in the direction of normal to the shock front. You can. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, yes, this is something that we have been trying to do. And actually, you can actually take this and actually resolve this. Yeah, yeah. um, and it is actually, the, 
uh, it's equivalent to rotating the building as well. You know, this is just startling. You know, the locations of the building. It's not only the location of the building; it's the orientation of the building as well, and compared to the orientation of the shock front as well. Um, yeah, Tony. You said that the um, that the that San Francisco fault was also a super shear. Yes. What's the evidence for that? Well. Uh, there is a professor, Greg Berosa at Stanford, has done a, a, an extensive uh, study uh, looking at evidence of final slip after this from all geodetic data and old records. And the, the net slip associated with this event can only be produced by super shear rupture. So basically, he has actually extensive maps of slip. Uh, historic data. It's amazing. There were some primitive instruments at that time. Um, and he, uh, if you have not, uh, if you integrate, actually, these are velocities. If you integrate the velocities, you will see actually uh, uh, amazing amounts of slip associated with this. This was three kilometers. If you integrate the fault parallel, you will get a, a movement at, uh, uh, relative to the fault of about five to six meters. On the fault, it could be 15 meters. And that is the result of the super shear that, um, that actually produces the two parts of the pulse, the super shear part and then the, the trailing mother. And that was the evidence for that. Yes, have you looked at the frequency content uh, of these ground motions that you generated? Because you're showing the velocity trace here. If you were to get the acceleration, you could look at the spectrum to see what you know what kind of frequencies are in this and how similar exactly exactly. Uh, exactly, and that's very important to do actually. Um, I'm nervous a little bit about uh, uh, differentiating experimental data. However, it is something that one has to do, and actually Swami has been looking at them because the input we have to actually differentiate it because the input of a lot of these codes is is ground acceleration. Yes, and it's, it has to do with the other frequencies that are in this problem. Um, so I cannot give you exact numbers, but um, I can tell you that this is being done. This is very, uh, very recent. Yeah, just in terms of the material, I understood that the super shear depends on the minus three halves, okay? But what about the material, the frictional uh, of property? Yeah, yeah. It, it really depends on it depends on the nature of the frictional law. Um, the, this is a very rich subject from mechanics, from the point of view of mechanics. Uh, Rice has shown theoretically that if you assume Coulomb friction in these interfaces, you your elastodynamic problem becomes ill-posed. So there is no way that you'll find a solution with simple Coulomb. You have to. Uh, assume a much more advanced uh, uh, type of frictional laws called rate and state frictional laws, in which there are history variables, just like plasticity, which regularize the problem. And there is convergence. So really, the nature of the frictional law will actually affect the result of transition as well. I'm not just showing you all the uh, I, I was just showing you the dependence on the load. Because actually, depending on what frictional law you, you implement, the answer is different. So there is clear dependence on the friction, the nature of the frictional law, and on the frictional, the steady state frictional coefficients, static and dynamic. But in all cases, you will have a super shear velocity. I mean, for all the mass some, some extent. If you have a mathematically straight no. fault, and you allow the earthquake to go forever, you will eventually get super shear. The, the issue is that, thank God, we don't have mathematically straight San Andreas faults because we may unzip on super shear from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, and that would not be very pleasant. Uh, but thank God, it doesn't happen. There was a movie once that California was separated from But it is the jogs and the nonlinearities that exist, the jogs and the kinks of the fault that arrest the, the rupture. As a matter of fact, what is a big earthquake? If you just think about it, just define in your minds, 
You know, I asked Professor Karanori when I was starting to learn this issue, uh, what is a big earthquake? The earthquake rapture does not know when it's going to stop. Its magnitude and its moment depends on how long it propagated. Before it propagates, it would not know how, how big it was. So a big earthquake is one that hasn't stopped yet, so to speak. Uh, that's, that's, that's one characteristic that, uh, but if it encounters a barrier, it could stop, and then it's not such a big earthquake. You have a question over here. Um, is there anything unusual that happens on the locus from the transition point? So when your parallel motion and your uh, normal one occur at the same time? Now this is actually a very good question. What happens exactly at the transition point? Well, I, uh, we have spent a lot of time understanding what is the transition mechanism. If you go to fracture mechanics and you have one crack tip that is going at one certain speed and you do the energetics of whether it is it uses energy or emits energy, you will find that actually there is a forbidden regime between the Rayleigh wave speed and the shear wave speed and nothing can happen. So there is a barrier, an energetic barrier that does not allow the crack tip to jump from one to the other. So the crack being a clever one does not jump from one to the other. It generates a daughter crack which actually is born intersonic in the allowed regime in front of it. So it never actually transitions itself. So your question would not be exactly well posed. So we, so we have two ruptures, one, one zipper that goes sub -rally, and in front of it another mini zipper that is now going much faster. And they, co they actually uh, coincide and the whole thing has unzipped. So there is no dichotomy in this. Please. So, so is this similar to the hop bifurcation problem where you actually have the squeezing of brakes and stuff like that where the, the slip propagates at some speed and is that, is that? Yeah. There are similarities there. There are great similarities there. I always wonder whether when we have plastic shoes and we, we create these funny noises, those are mini yeah, shock waves. Yeah. yeah. One last question, Bruce, did you have? Yeah, I was just, uh, one other question is the, um, Actually, the shear wave velocity varies a lot with depth. You know, at the yes. surface, it might be three kilometers, and you go deeper into the mantle, it might be five kilometers a second or something Absolutely. like that. So I'm wondering if this faster propagation is, is from deep, the deep propagation of shear waves, and then coming up. You know, so um, the surface propagation is slower than the deep propagation of the wave. And, sure. and this, I mean, certainly, What's happening in Earth's crust is quite a bit different than your plastic sheet, which has yeah. probably a uniform uh, shear wave velocity. So let me tell you that the, I agree absolutely that there are depth, uh, great depth, uh, <coughs> no uniformities, but also the strength or the resistance to the interface actually goes the other way. It's more difficult to slip down than to slip up okay. because the compressive stress, because of hydrostatic. Uh, because of uh, basically weight, mass, the compressive stress is much bigger. So is the locking of the interface. So, so it is sometimes also there's a competing effect. It's easier to propagate in the f on the surface than than depth as well. So it's it's a complicated. So this makes this kind of an experiment. This is the two-dimensional uh, um, analog of, of this. So in our, our new investigation, we actually have tried to do exactly what you say and create specimens whose thickness is such that the bottom is more locked or more resistive and rupture happens in, on the top as it's known to happen in most of the earthquakes and there is some gradation of properties. So, but that, of course, is the next step, which is actually quite uh, demanding. It's not as simple as that. It's true that actually some of the features, depending on the speed of the rupture, on the surface may be actually coming from depth. But there is a limited depth at which dynamic information can reach in time.
So it's a very interesting point that you're bringing. So Ari, since I know that by reading your list of awards that you don't have your walls in your office, I'm sure, are empty. I uh, want to leave you with a small memento of your visit. It uh, reads Irish Rosakis, College Distinguished Lecture, January 24, 2012. Thank you. This was fascinating. Thank you for Thank being you here. Thank you very, very much. It's a great honor. Thank you. It comes apart. Oh. Let's put it in a box. Thank you. <laughs>